but you probably already know that because it's the number one topic of all the being pregnant books. My favorite was Dr. Bar was written by Dr. Barbara Luke. So there I am on the preemie board, getting beaten up because I ha was nervy enough to tell people what I had done. I had just spent an entire pregnancy beating myself up because I wasn't eating right, because I was throwing up nonstop. So the whole healthy diet thing was really on my mind uh, because it contains what babies need. And having people angry with me for talking about giving my kids vitamins and minerals was kind of a shock. But the good thing was, in order to prove my point, I started investigating. And as my children continued to thrive, I realized one of three things had to be going on. One, I had given birth to mutant babies. This seemed unlikely. Two, I had holy babies, special because of my powerful praying. And God had healed my children, in particular because, well, I wasn't sure why. And being that kind of special seemed unlikely. Or three, I had done something no one else had. And if other people did it, they'd get the same results. In other words, a repeatable miracle or science. I decided to go with option three. I nagged the NICU doctors to investigate, but they were really busy. That's when I learned the unspoken doctor rule. If you aren't sick, they're really happy for you because it leaves them more time for them to take care of the patients who really need their time and attention. A cynical person might say healthy people are not billable, but I've never met a physician who didn't care more about the health of his patients than he did their well-being. So I'm going to go with so many people needing help, so little time to give it. It also means physicians have a tendency to not investigate what the people who don't visit them are doing to get the good results. The children were two years old before I got stubborn about the whole situation. I started calling and mailing every professional I could find to try and get them to investigate what I'd done. I called the best hospitals in the country, the published experts in the field, the March of Dimes, the State Health Department, the formula companies, the insurance companies, and even the folks at the National Institutes of Health. They suggested I try to find somebody to investigate, and pretty much I got nowhere. We were formally diagnosed as lucky, and no one was interested in how we got that way. The breakthrough happened in August of 2009 when I was complaining on one of my favorite social websites, shout out to Democratic Underground, about how no one was willing to investigate what I suspected had made the difference. And a member named Fubar said, yep, it's right here on page 631 of the textbook of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition. And oh my heavens, he was right. It says, the premature infant is at increased risk of trace mineral deficiency because trace mineral accretion occurs during, takes place during the last trimester of pregnancy. Everything fell into place. Premature babies traditionally catch up between one and two years of age because that's when they start eating real food, which contains trace minerals, because everything has some trace minerals in it, even McDonald's. All I had done was an early supplementation, and boom, we were caught up. But how had the doctors missed it? They tried to correct it intravenously. I had given it to my babies orally, which is how human beings, for as long as there have been human beings, have gotten their nutrition through their mouth and through their stomach. Let me repeat that. It has to be given orally. And breast milk alone wasn't enough, because women who had just given birth were usually deficient themselves, so enough wasn't being passed along. But even pointing out it was textbook didn't motivate the medical community to replicate my results. People were happy with our good outcome. Did I mention my kids are awesome and cute? But resources are limited, and this was just too easy, obvious, simple. Half a teaspoon of micronutrients in a bottle once a day and boom, normal babies? Yes, it really was that simple. Part of the problem had to do with understanding trace or micro minerals versus macro minerals. What do minerals do? Well, the number one function is their building functions affect the skeletons and all soft tissues. Their regulating functions include a wide variety of systems such as the heartbeat, blood clotting, maintenance of the internal pressure of the body, nerve responses, the transport of oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. Even though they make up only a small portion of the body, about 4% of your body weight. Minerals are essential to life. They are also very stable. They cannot be destroyed by light, water, heat, 
food handling properties processes. In fact, the little bit of ash that remains when a food is completely burned is the mineral content. The ma major minerals, or macro minerals, are present in relatively large amounts in the body and are required in fairly large amounts in the diet. More than 250 milligrams daily, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium fall into this category, as well as the electrolytes, sodium, chloride, sulfur, and potassium. The electrolytes are grouped together because their work is so interrelated. They help regulate cellular fluid and transmit nerve impulses. The trace minerals are needed in much smaller quantities, less than 20 milligrams. Most trace minerals do not occur in the body in their free form, uh, but they're bound to organic compounds on which they depend for transport. There's, more, there's a complete list on the slide that you can look at, but the bottom line is this. A balanced diet that includes a variety of foods in a moderate amount is the best way to consume a safe, an adequate amount. There's common clinical trace mineral deficiency issues. Most of your doctors know these. Chromium, for example, when you are deficient in it, uh, can produce a diabetes-like condition without actually being diabetes. When you have an iodine deficiency, uh, the body cannot make enough th thyroxin. Um, it's going to burn calories more slowly and you're going to gain weight. You can also get neurological, gastrointestinal, and skin abnormalities. An iron deficiency, most people know this one, can lead to anemia along with fatigue, weakness, and increased risk for infections. And zinc, if you have a lack of zinc during pregnancy, can lead to mental retardation and birth defects. Zinc deficiency can also lead to poor night vision and poor wound healing with other symptoms including appetite loss, uh, taste changes, decrease in the sense of smell, skin changes, and reduced resistance to infection. Some of the lesser known trace mineral deficiencies include boron, germanium, manganese, uh, molybdenum. You can read all about these on the slide. Now, how do you get the minerals? There's three types of mineral supplementation. The first is metallic minerals. Uh, this is not really good for you. It's hard to be absorbed. The second is chelated minerals. This is the cheapest way of doing it, and it's what we use in our veterinary practices. Human beings, however, don't like the taste. For human beings, the best way to absorb the trace minerals is colloidal minerals. Have your eyes glazed over yet? You can Google all of this information later. But now let's talk about another statistic. Cerebral palsy patients. 70% are born prematurely. Now that you know that the premature infant frequently suffers from a trace mineral deficiency, tell me if you can tell the difference between a child with cerebral palsy or one starving to death due to famine. Parents intuitively know something is wrong with these children because their children aren't gaining weight and growing like the other children. Pediatricians know something is wrong because they can see the failure to thrive, but fixing it nutritionally? Unheard of, except it's not. What I'm talking about is not a new discovery. The results of a study by O'Connor in 2007 said, adding a, mi a multinutrient fortifier to approximately one half of the milk provided to predominantly human milk-fed infants for 12 weeks after hospital discharge may be an effective strategy in addressing early discharge nutrient def deficits and poor growth. 30 years ago, researchers found that preterm infants grew better when formula, human milk, or banked human milk was supplemented with protein and minerals. And the World Health Organization has been using micronutrient supplementation to combat severe acute malnutrition since 1996 with a product called Plumpy Nut. And the veterinarians have been using it, this stuff, for decades. In the veterinary world, this is, there's extensive research existing on the nutritional needs of animals in the literature. And due to the high dollar costs associated with losses caused by birth defects and low birth weight in the industrial farm, these issues have been extensively addressed and solved. Chelated minerals are used to prevent, quote unquote, mortality and other health issues. Chelated minerals in animal nutrition have been used since the 1950s. Trace mineral chelates have proven to be better than inorganic materials in meeting the nutritional needs of modern farm animals. This is another slide talking about chelated minerals. The role and source of minerals 
in the veterinary world is the object of supplementation with trace minerals is to avoid a variety of deficiency diseases. They are essential for optimum health, growth, and productivity. And supplementary minerals help ensure good growth, bone development, feathering in birds, hoof, skin, and hair quality in mammals, enzyme structure and functions, and appetite. Deficiency of trace minerals affect many metabolic, me, metabolic processes and so be, may be manifested by different systems. Symptoms such as poor growth and appetite, reproductive failures, impaired immune responses, and general ill thrift. From the 1950s to the 1990s, most trace mineral supplementation of animal diets was in the form of inorganic minerals and these largely eradicated associated deficiency diseases in farm animals. In the California dairy industry, for example, they found that trace minerals such as iodine, copper, sil and selenium were essential. If they, deficiencies in any of these trace minerals occurred, they saw an increase in sick and or dead calves. With horses, they found the same thing. It is well known that providing adequate levels of trace minerals is required for proper immune function. Because of the increased availability of chelated products, it is through thought that their use will enhance immune function. And by the way, it does. Here's a whole bunch of research on it. Even the vet textbooks uh, totally address it. Uh, fading dead puppy and kitten syndrome clearly states nutritional deprivation during pregnancy can com compromise immunological competence of the offspring. There's even evidence that, quote, severe malnutrition during pregnancy can adversely affect immunocompetence, not only in the offspring from that pregnancy, but also in those offspring's subsequent young, even though they are fed adequately. The reticulendothelial system, is, which is basically your immune system, is highly vulnerable to nutritional and metabolical derangement during its period of formation and development. Now, since it exists in standard veterinary practice, the textbooks, standard veterinary practice solves it. When a mineral imbalance is present, determining the specific minerals involved is difficult because the same clinical signs and similar lesions often characterize several mineral deficiencies or excesses. The best approach in most cases is to feed a diet known to contain the proper amount and balance of minerals for normal growth. This is better than attempting to correct the amount of any one or several suspect minerals by using a mineral supplement, thereby risking intensifying the imbalances or causing additional mineral imbalances. In hindsight, I'd seen it for myself back in 2003. We used to do rescue work with puppies, and we received, we got a batch of puppies, and one of them, it was almost as if her legs were collapsing underneath her. I panicked, rushed her to the emergency vet, um, this is excerpts from the write-up that the vet did. Uh, she was presented for walking funny. <laughs> she was, uh, she can stand and walk but appears weak in both carpi. They are mildly not hyperextended. She had no bone curvature, no bone or, bone or joint pain. The treatment given by the vet was she advised rescue personnel that she suspected a nutritional deficiency. The instructions were to continue to feed her a high quality puppy food and watch for resolution of the problem over the next two to three months. And the outcome was all symptoms vanished within six weeks.